Great. Welcome everyone. Um, today uh, is an exciting session and we're really happy to have each of you with us. Um, we've just heard from, from the youth and now we have uh, our final panel on climate justice and child protection. Um, this session is about climate justice and child protection, exploring good practices from the field. And we have seven speakers today who will uh, share with us about what has been happening and some of the potential for moving forward. Um, we've just been challenged by youth in the last session, um, hearing how protection needs to be extended to our natural world um, with whom we are all a part of, and it is youth who will inherit the earth. So we really need to be shifting from one uh, into an ethic of care and away from this profit over people and ecosystems dominant approach with children at the center. Um, so my name is Laura Lee. I'll be guiding you through the session. I'm the COVID-19 focal point at the Alliance. Um, so we have three presentations with seven speakers today, exploring um, the good practices from the field, how we can end violence while addressing the global climate crisis, exploring anticipatory action, which links really well with our theme around prevention of this whole conference, and um, also exploring child participation as well. And so just to note the questions today will be in a Jamboard link. So feel free to um, put your questions there. There's instructions there to choose the fourth icon down as Katrina's showing us to add on a sticky note. And we will have some time at the end to address a few questions or at least one. So thank you for that. And so just click on that link and add your questions there. Um, so we're gonna start with a Mentimeter with a poll for you. So please click on the link that you see in the chat. There will be three questions and we'll put the results up so we can see it as we go. Um, the first question uh, shouldn't be too tricky for you or to require too much thinking. Um, I'm not sure what time it is for each of you, but it's just what region do you work in? Uh, we'd love to see an array of answers here. Um, so we have some representation from South Asia, North America, Europe, and Central Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, West and Central Africa, Middle East and North Africa. East and Southern Africa, thank you. So please continue to put those answers in for one more minute. Great, East and Southern Africa, good representation as well. This is one of those topics where it's important to have perspectives from everywhere. So this is wonderful to see. Um, okay, and then the next question is how confident do you feel about working in climate crisis and child protection? So share with us how confident you feel. You're having a shifting scale from around, sticking around two out of five. And as we've mentioned in the previous sessions, uh, climate action is one of the is part of the strategic plan of uh, an area to move towards and strengthen. And so it looks like we have some, some work to do to gain confidence in that area. Thank you. And the final question is, what words do you associate with climate crisis and child protection? And here we have anticipatory action, unclear. There's a, <laughs> a large unclear, vulnerability, opportunity, intersectionality, how to integrate the two, more of a question. Child leadership um, needs to be child-centered. Uh, interconnection, um, opportunity, resiliency, prevention, participation, uh, holistic, urgent, family separation, child leadership. So some great words coming up, interesting vulnerabilities in the center. Um, we are all vulnerable to, in, this, in this regard, but um, child-led actions, um, poverty, it's long overdue. 
thank you for those thoughts. That's uh, something we should uh, take and move forward with. Um, great, now I'm going to introduce our first speakers. Um, from World Vision International. They'll be speaking on ending violence against children while addressing the global climate crisis. Uh, we have y Yukiko uh, Yamada Morovic with us. She's been working in the field of international development for over 15 years. She's currently the, direct, the technical director of external engagement and programming with World Vision International. In her role, she provides technical support for World Vision's environmental stewardship and climate resilience programming in close collaboration with the field offices. We also have Lavenda Ondere with us, who's a technical specialist um, with an environmental conservation and climate change background. She works with World Vision Kenya, mostly in Marsabit County, implementing integrated management of natural resource programs that seeks to build resilience to climate related shocks through climate smart interventions. We're thrilled to have you both with us. Lavenda and Yukiko, over to you. Thank you so much. I would like to, if someone can put up the presentation and at the same time, I would like to start with a bit of a pop quiz. So if you could put the Google poll as well, Zoom poll. In the meantime, yes, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Yukiko. I work for World Vision International and together with Lavenda, we are going to present presentation. So it's a very quick pub quiz. So please uh, hit the button as soon as possible. So the first question is, according to the latest UNICEF's data released in September, how many children globally live in extremely high risk countries of climate change? Then the second, uh, second question is about the latest IPCC report. At the current pace of global warming, when do we reach this 1.5 degrees warming limit? So please hit the button and then let's count 10. And 9, 8, well, 1. Please put the results up, please. Gosh, very, very, very interesting and very pessimistic results. Gosh, super interesting. And um, I won't give you the answer because the answer will be in my presentation. So please stay tuned. And if someone can share the presentation now. Excellent. Next slide, please. Next, please. So in the previous session, I think there was, well, even though the Mentimeter has been super useful to see um, our sort of, to get the temperature check about the linkages between climate change and children. But I think it's quite clear that both themes are very much inter interlinked and everything is connected. So we are all vulnerable, but even more so the children both the current lives and their future. Next slide, please. I think, uh, well, the current uh, climate crisis and violence against children, these are the two massive challenges that the humanity is facing at the moment. So with the current pace, global warming would reach this 1.5 degree threshold as early as 2030. I think I, uh, it was the correct answer. And 1 billion children, almost half of the global population, are at extremely high risk of climate change. The links between these two challenges are not always obvious, but they do exist in terms of causality, but also solutions. And various SDGs do address both violence against children and uh, climate action. And tackling climate change can also impact positively in certain contexts where children are at high risk of experiencing violence. Next slide, please. This is the data from 2015. As you could see, the regional burden on violence against children, of course, uh, one of the challenges is to get the correct data about violence against children, but you could see that the regions where highest incidence of risks or risks of violence against children are also the regions which are very much vulnerable to climate change and the climate 
induced extreme weather events. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the causal um, correlations or linkages between uh, climate change and violence against children. The, the link is not always direct, but it is very clear that the combined effects of climate change and social vulnerabilities would exacerbate the shocks and stress and negative coping mechanisms of the households and uh, children's caretakers. So it is very clear that children's vulnerability and exposure to violence are actually uh, increased and accelerated by this climate crisis. And extreme weather events or disasters caused by climate change um, have serious uh, impacts on the on children's uh, caregivers and households, which tend which then increase the uh, violence against children, such as uh, child labour forced marriage, um, child trafficking, uh, domestic violence, school dropouts. Now, there's no magic solution as such, but as the Mentimeter, uh, I could see lots of keywords. One of the solutions and um, is to empower children as uh, agents of change against climate change in both climate adaptation and mitigation effort. And at the same time, they do play a very important role in reducing the risks of violence against them. So I'll stop here because this is enough theory here and my colleague Lavenda from World Vision Kenya can explain a little bit more the case study from the field. So next slide please and I'll pass the microphone to Lavenda. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I'm so I'm clear and everyone can get me. Uh, I'm going to uh, give some case study uh, in the northern, from the northern counties of Kenya. And as you all uh, know, or as you may know, that uh, arid and semi-arid lands of Kenya make up to 89% of the landscapes. And this is supporting approximately 38% of the population in Kenya. Uh, this population are mainly uh, pastoralists and uh, they depend uh, mainly on the environment and nature for provision. So as uh, the climate crisis is going uh, on, uh, we've seen these areas are experiencing extreme climate related shocks. We have the long droughts, we have uh, 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 high degradation, land degradation, erratic rains, and the average temperatures are, are, are getting higher and higher. This is affecting the livelihoods of these communities. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, from the climate shocks or the crisis that uh, climate change has brought on board, we've seen, uh, uh, we've seen an increase in violence against children in these communities. Uh, one is the families are forcefully marrying off young children in, in exchange for livestock, because for some of these communities, livestock is the main source of livelihood and is, is considered prestigious to have more livestock. So when they are affected by drought and the, the livestock die off, the only way to replenish this is to uh, uh, marry off the young girls and uh, I look at uh, one count, which is Marsabit, where there is 80% privilege for, uh, to FGM, that is female uh, genital mutilation. And for one to be considered marriage, the girl has to undergo a uh, female uh, genital mutilation, which is to us is, a, is, a, is, a, is some sort of violence to the child. Uh, the next one is about the, the, the cattle rustling that come with the uh, drought because now the people start uh, uh, fighting for the uh, uh, fighting for the few resources, the diminishing resources that is the pasture and the water. And this causes violence. This leads to violence between communities. Uh, as violence erupts, you see women and children suffer the most because the men are often uh, moving away or they're able to defend themselves. And during this crisis, you see these rape cases, we, children and women are always the victims of this violence. The others are, are when because of drought, families are forced to uh, 
to, mon to nomadism and they, are, they, are, they move away to other areas where uh, they are able to get pasture and water. And they are forced to leave the children behind with relatives or they are forced to uh, make sure uh, to leave children with people who, who subject these children to child labor and other forms of uh, uh, often maybe rape because they, most of these children are not left with their immediate relatives who are, who are able to offer protection to them. So they're exposed to rape, case, to rape and child labor. And uh, just the harsh climatic conditions uh, also has led to children migrating to the rural urban migration where uh, families are moving to the uh, mushrooming towns and these areas are where the girls are exposed to prostitution and other forms of violence. And uh, from that, uh, we've seen that there's an increase with the increasing climate crisis in Kenya and especially in the northern counties. These cases of violence are, are increasing on a daily basis. And uh, that is why, uh, next slide, World Vision Kenya has come up with programs that are able to uh, uh, help communities to adapt or increase their resilience to climate change. Uh, one of them is promoting of the alternative livelihoods and the climate smart agriculture. Uh, by promoting alternative uh, livelihoods, we've seen, uh, we, are we are supporting communities to gain uh, livelihoods other than from livestock so that when, when there's a, there's a livestock is affected and their life, main source of life, uh, livelihood is affected, they're able to get some uh, money from other economic activities, uh, businesses, and this we are promoting through the value chains and the market system approach, where we are teaching them business approaches. And uh, we are also depending on the nature and, and uh, non-wood forest products where, which are available in the areas. So the, the communities are able to tap into these resources and gain alternative resources. Others are the uh, regreening initiatives. And for World Vision Kenya, we are promoting a model called the farmer managed natural regeneration. Uh, this is an integrated approach where we are supporting, we are supporting the uh, uh, restoration the environment and the livelihoods because we are promoting value value uh, uh, trees with high value to the communities. So uh, with these programs and also uh, involving children into the restoration activities, we've seen uh, families settling more and the movement of uh, because of drought has reduced. We are also supporting them in climate uh, adaptation through the disaster risk management where communities are able to participate and form their own uh, community disaster risk reduction uh, approaches. And they're able to gain, uh, to do early warning for planning. And this with among other uh, initiatives are helping communities to settle more and uh, also address at the same time, address the violence against children that we, uh, has been witnessed earlier on. I think that is the end of my presentation today. Thank you very much, uh, Yukiko and Lavenda. It's wonderful to actually see some of the concrete examples of what's happening with uh, climate justice and child protection and reducing violence against children. Uh, now we're gonna move on to the next presentation on anticipatory action and child protection. Uh, we have with us Audrey Oetli, who has joined the IFRC Protection, Gender and Inclusion Team as a consultant to support a partnership with CPAOR and UNICEF. We have Irene Amuron, who leads the anticipatory action portfolio at the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. Uh, Ron Powells, who's the CPAOR coordinator. Bridget Rudrum, who works as a resilient specialist for Plan International and who we'll hear more from as well. And Ahmad Mohamed Salim is the manager of the Inclusion Protection Education and Learning Unit at the IFRC and Red Crescent Societies. So welcome all and over to you, Audrey, first. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as mentioned, so I'm Audrey, and I'll be happy to lead you through our session on anticipatory action and child protection this afternoon. The International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies, the Climate Center, the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, and the Anticipation Hub have recently released an issue brief on anticipatory action and child protection. 
we've seen in the previous session and, and the presentation we had just now uh, that children represent a high portion of the populations affected by emergencies. Their voices are mostly unheard and they are at high risk uh, to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. We also know that there is a lack of investment and services available to protect children in emergencies. And climate related emergencies will identify this risk for children. Yet, according to our research, the linkages between child protection and anticipatory action are presently not occurring. And there is even less uh, or very few practical examples of protection in anticipatory action. This is even more so for child protection. Therefore, in this session, we will briefly explain what is anticipatory action and discuss about the importance of local coordination and child participation prior to giving some concrete examples of actions that can be undertaken to include child protection outcomes in anticipatory action. So to get us started, please let me hand over to Irene. Irene, you are the ma program manager for anticipatory action. Please change the slide and go two slides further. I forgot to tell you. Yes, perfect. So Irene, you're, you're leading our work uh, for the Red Cross Red Cross and Climate Center. Could you please tell us more about anticipatory action? What is this concept about? And why is child protection an important element to include? Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Audrey. Hello, everybody, wherever you're calling in from uh, the world, and thank you for joining us. Yes, um, anticipatory action is an approach that uh, we are trying to implement in terms of addressing the impacts of climate change. As most of us may be familiar that in the recently published IPCC report, the statistics are quite grim. You know, we are expecting uh, more and if and frequent climate impacts, and of course, uh, impacting the most vulnerable. But that doesn't mean that we should sit down and do nothing, because also research was done that if we do nothing by 2050, we'll have almost 200 million people in need of humanitarian aid. So this is where anticipatory action comes in. And basically, we are saying these are set of actions that are taken to be able to prevent or mitigate uh, climate impacts before they actually occur. So we'd like to take advantage of the window period between when we get the information or early warning information and the time that these events are uh, felt by the communities, by the people. And we want to take action in that window period. And all these actions, of course, are taken based on a prediction on how the event will occur. And I'm happy to note that at least within the Red Cross movement, we have, over th uh, we have around 30 national societies who are engaged in this approach. And globally, we have uh, uh, over 60 uh, initiatives going on. So why are we interested in uh, anticipatory action and where does it sit within the disaster risk uh, reduction uh, continuum? As you can see in the, uh, in the diagram uh, on the screen is that anticipatory action actually sits between preparedness and response. And personally, I like calling anticipatory action the acute part of DRR because we are taking advantage of the window period that small time that we do have to implement these early actions before the impacts are actually felt. So while our traditional disaster risk reduction is focused on analyzing and reducing exposure to hazards and vulnerability, within anticipatory action, we would like to aim to prevent, mitigate, or protect um, against the impacts based on a forecast or any predictive analytics that could be done. And also, in some cases, be able to prepare for early response. So for example, we could be able to preposition items, and when we get early warning information, and then we, we distribute those items. So that aspect of uh, prepositioning would look at it as part of preparing for early response. So if you can see, we are emphasizing that anticipatory action should be part and parcel of disaster risk management, and it shouldn't be done in isolation. And why are we uh, interested in anticipatory action and child protection? It is because, as you've already seen, our colleagues from World Vision, they've said, you know, uh, uh, they've given us the, the figures that one billion children are affected by uh, by climate impacts. And also uh, a recent UNHCR report indicated that children are the most affected when disasters occur. So this is an honor for us to preposition children in the midst of our planning for anticipatory action and ensure that they uh, participate in these whole processes. Thank you and over to you, Audrey. Thank you, Irene. And please change to the next slide. I would like to turn to Ron Powers. Ron, as a global coordinator for the child protection area of responsibility, could you please explain why local coordination for child protection needs 
uh, needs to be part of anticipatory action. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for, for your question. Um, so once the emergency are actually projected to occur, uh, it's needed that we have deliberate action to ensure that children's needs, and especially those most at risk of harm, are actually identified and recognized, and that early local action is also taken through coordinated approaches. So the early warnings that Irene also referred to need to be contextualized and interpreted into expected risks for children. And categories of children at risk must also be identified. For, for instance, we know that some populations of children, such as girls or children connected to the streets or involved in labor or children with disabilities, children who are married or at risk of being married, have particular protection risks in emergencies that we really need to, to prioritize. We can do this through consultations with children and key local stakeholders, reviewing the existing data and learning from the past emergencies as well. But we need to go beyond consultations with children, and we'll hear more about that in the next session, to really ensure the meaningful participation of children. And as the Under Secretary General of the IFRC said earlier, children are their own best experts. And it's important that they have adequate information to make informed decisions but also about where to go for help around protection issues in emergencies. And we furthermore need to make sure that they have continued access to education and protection services before, during, as well as after emergencies. And in that way, we need to work with the education sector as well as other sectors. Now to prioritize action for children, this understanding of risks really must be shared by all the actors and children's voices must be taken into account by them as well. So therefore local coordination and joint planning between relevant government ministries, child protection and education practitioners, including those at community level, the international and national NGOs, the UN and Red Cross and Red Crescent national societies, as well as technical experts and scientists in, in key is, is really key across all phases of the emergency preparedness and response until recovery. So to prevent, address, and mitigate risks children face, we need to work together in a coordinated manner. It's the best way and probably also the only way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And next slide, please. I would like to turn to Brigitte. Brigitte, you are currently working with Plan International as resilience specialist. Could you share some concrete examples of entry points to ensure that children can meaningfully participate in the development and in the implementation of anticipatory actions? Yes, thank you, Audrey, and um, good afternoon, everyone. So in answer to your question, firstly, as we have heard earlier today, we must recognize that children, and especially girls, are one of the most vulnerable groups to climate change and will suffer disproportionately from its immediate and long-term impacts. So with climate change impacting protection and participation, it's breaching children's rights and makes the climate crisis a child's rights crisis. So children firstly therefore have a right to have their voices heard on the decisions and actions that impact them today and into the future. And this must include the anticipatory action agenda, as we have heard uh, from Irene, positioned as a key mechanism to address the impacts of climate change. But currently anticipatory action approaches are not sufficiently child informed or child sensitive. So there's a big opportunity here for the child protection sector to engage and influence. And aside from it being a matter of children's rights, children's, children are also the best place to talk about their own experiences and identify solutions to their needs. And furthermore, children should not be viewed as passive victims of climate change. They have the potential to be powerful protagonists for change and play a meaningful role in anticipatory action. So we'll explore this further um, in my presentation in a moment. But for now, um, we can share a few suggestions of possible ways for children to engage on anticipatory action, which of course need to be contextualized. But firstly, children should be consulted about the risks that they may face. However, it's crucial that this process is inclusive to ensure the anticipatory actions that are identified then consider the differentiated impacts of climate change on children determined by a variety of factors, including gender, ethnicity, disability, legal status, and poverty. So the inclusion of the most marginalized groups is imperative. And then in the anticipatory action space, children can develop child-friendly messages 
to interpret early warning messages and guide children's actions in times of emergencies. And children can also directly implement early actions. For example, it's important for children to talk about what might happen to prepare themselves. For example, children can also develop their family safety plan and learn key contact details and names of family members. Children can share knowledge on where to seek help in case needed and can maintain peer-to-peer -peer support. Children can also review the early actions or anticipatory actions after the emergency to be part of the process in terms of providing feedback. But as I've said, these suggestions are only initial examples and would of course very much need to be contextualized. But there's some initial ideas um, as inspiration that we'll explore further um, in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for these examples and ideas that you're throwing. Um, now let's let's turn to Amjad. You're working as a manager for inclusion, protection, and, and engagement within the Federation. Which practical actions would you recommend actors undertake to improve child protection in anticipatory action? Thanks, uh, Audrey. Hi, everyone. Um, so just to follow on from, from what has been said already, I think I have three concepts that I'd like to share that, that could explore this. The first one is uh, to be inclusive, to include. And, and as Bridget has brilliantly sort of shared, there are some examples there of how we can ensure child participation in decisions that affect them. And you know, Ron has talked about going beyond consultation of children. Um, but I think when we do this, we also have to be aware of the diversity and heterogeneity of young people and children um, and the intersectionality of the challenges of vulnerability facing them. So, you know, when, when we look at this, we let's bear that in mind. So, you know, it's important to have youth engagement policies and strategies that really uh, help you and direct you towards uh, engaging with, with young people, inclusion of uh, child protection within anticipatory triggers and, um, and indicators. The second concept or the second aspect is, is to protect. So all agencies that interact with children need to have in place safeguarding mechanisms, say uh, in, internal protection systems. Um, this means, you know, thorough screening of staff, code of conduct in place, confidential reporting mechanisms, uh, training awareness, a focal point at, uh, at, at headquarters, but also at whatever regional branch offices that you have that is really tasked with dealing with this because it's not enough for it to be part of someone's job. It has to be someone's job, period. Um, so I think it's important to, to do that and continuously focus on building the, your team strengths. And then the third one is to engage, which is to, you really have to ensure access to helping services, to local coordination between agencies and government, understanding the local laws, advocacy with communities and authorities, evaluating responses, with, with, with children's leadership, engaging them. So include, protect, and, and engage, which incidentally is the name of the unit I manage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amjad. And uh, please move, move us to the next slide. So we have seen with our different speakers today that anticipatory action approaches can be adapted to further reduce the humanitarian impact of emergencies on children's protection. Currently, over 60 countries are implementing anticipatory approaches, and there is a growing interest in moving from small-scale pilots to anticipatory action at scale. Scaling up is an opportunity for us to do better by including child protection outcomes. And for this, we need to reach out to the practitioners already involved, sensitize them about the risks faced by children, and provide support for the inclusion of child protection outcomes. Thank you very much to everyone. Over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Audrey and team. Uh, we appreciate your insights um, on anticipatory action. Um, with five minutes remaining, I uh, just wanted to flag that there are some comments going into the Jamboard, some great questions, and some of the speakers will try to answer right on the Jamboard. I'm going to pass it over to Bridget Rudrum, um, our resilience specialist with Plan International. Thanks, Bridget. You are on mute, Bridget. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and for this final part of the session, um, we'll be focusing on children's participation. Um, and as introduced, my name is Bridget. I'm working as the resilience specialist at Plan International to strengthen resilience and climate change adaptation across our programming. Um, next slide, please. 
So aiming to build on the powerful insights and advice we've just heard from youth advocates in the previous session, we'll aim to further emphasise why children's participation is crucial on climate and child protection, highlight some practical approaches, explore ideas for opportunities and entry points for the child protection sector on climate change and end with some next steps. So I'd like to start with continuing on from Audrey's pre presentation when we introduced children's participation in antici anticipatory action as a specific mechanism to address climate change to now ask, uh, to ask you to think of what words come to mind for you on why children's participation on child protection and climate change is important. So if we could go to the Mentimeter, um, and this builds on the earlier word cloud, but now thinking specifically about participation. Okay, so to empower children and build their resilience, they are part of the ecosystem, exactly. Any other thoughts in terms of why it's crucial to um, engage children on climate change and child protection? minutes for any other answers that might come through. Okay, so to perhaps to add to those ideas we've got, um, we've discussed children are one of the most vulnerable groups to climate change. We've just talked about them having um, a right to engage in decisions that impact them. Exactly, it's just come, has just come through there, engaging children in decisions. They will inherit the decisions that are made today. Um, and we can also say that children are a best place to share their experiences and ideas for solutions on decisions that impact them. Yep, we've got it pertains to their future coming through here as well. Um, and crucially, children should not be viewed as passive victims. They can be powerful protagonists for change on the climate change and child protection agenda. Um, empower children to be active citizens in the future, exactly. Um, and another uh, line of thought that we haven't got up here yet is that participation and protection can intersect. So by empowering children to raise their voices or take action through a meaningful role against a harmful situation that they are in or have experienced, can create a psychological protection through making children feel more in control, hopeful and resilient. So we'll return to this again later in the presentation. So thank you for those thoughts. And if we go back to the main slides. And the next slide. So we agree that children's participation is crucial, but what are the spaces for children to engage? Prior to the pandemic in 2019, we saw an unprecedented moment in which youth perspectives on climate change and justice took center stage. Millions of youth across the world took to the streets demanding climate action inspired by Greta Thunberg. Yet to date, youth-led climate protests have largely focused on climate mitigation. So calling governments to account to reduce their emissions. However, children and youth can also be effective agents of change to advance climate adaptation. So this is focused on reducing the impacts of climate change and it's adaptation that directly aligns with programming action to reduce the risk of child protection issues that we've heard about in the earlier presentations being exacerbated by the climate crisis. However, despite strong grassroots child and youth led activism, as was highlighted by uh, the youth activists earlier today, the formal spaces for children's participation on climate action at local, national and global level remains limited. And with reference to child protection, a global report by the IFRC last year concluded that children do not have a voice on the child protection mechanisms, policy and laws that affect them in climate disasters. As the policy brief highlight highlighted, we need to do better. Next slide, please. So one of the few examples of formal space for young people to engage on climate decision making and action is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, offering the chance for young people to voice their opinions through Youngo. In September this year, we saw the first pre-COP youth event and Youth for Climate Summit in which youth activists called for urgent, meaningful action, providing concrete proposals for UN negotiators and leaders at COP26. As you'll be aware, the the uh, COP26 is the United Nations 26th annual climate change conference coming up in November this year. And at the pre-COP, 
Vanessa Nakate, a climate change activist from Uganda, spoke powerfully about the need for climate change adaptation. Crucially, she also emphasized impacts on child protection risks and child marriage, as per the quote here. And she ended her speech by advocating for inclusive approaches. In line with this, it's evident we need to do much more to ensure children and youth from across the world have the spaces to participate and act on climate change and the decisions that impact them. Next slide, please. Hence, we now want to share a few quick examples of practical inclusive approaches to advance children's participation on climate change and child protection from local to global levels. And with climate change being a cross-sectoral topic, it is crucial to take a multi-risk informed approach to developing actions, considering diverse perspectives across sectors and stakeholders, crucially including children. And PLAN's multi-risk toolkit has a range of participatory interactive activities to empower children to share their perspectives. These tools can be integrated into child protection programming to add a multi-risk climate change framing. For example, the seasonal calendar is looking at hazards and extreme weather events and their impacts throughout the year and is a useful tool for this purpose. Next slide, please. Another resource we wanted to share is the Wired Act curriculum, supporting adolescents to take action in their communities to adapt to climate change. It starts with a games-based interactive learning phase to introduce climate change and the impacts across the world, before then contextualizing this to your community, identifying vulnerabilities and capacities and coming up with an action plan. Wired Act then supports a six week action phase where young people implement their action, followed by a sharing phase to capture the action on an adaptation card, which is shared with the next group of youth and online on an interactive world map. So Wired Act currently introduces differentiated impacts, but there is a clear potential here to develop this aspect further and could offer an entry point to better integrate considerations of child protection risks and youth led action on climate change adaptation. So a potential opportunity to explore. And next slide, please. And then I wanted to share an action research approach, which is an example of adding a child protection lens to an existing climate change methodology. So this one is an example um, that IFRC used earlier this year with adolescents in Trinidad and Tobago, with real examples from children that align to some of the insights we heard um, earlier today. Here, we start by discussing climate change, exacerbating extreme weather events around the world. Children then identify the ones that they have experienced, adding a person icon, if we can click. The ones that happen most often, adding a tick, if we can tick a, a click again. And then the ones that have the biggest impact for them, adding a star. We then talk about how climate change impacts them and their rights. And they add yellow post-it notes online on this virtual platform to discuss their impacts. Um, we then use this to frame the conversation to link towards how these climate impacts may then exacerbate child protection risks. So we start by talking about impacts on mental health and they add post-its um, linking to mental health. So if we can click again. And then we move the discussion towards possible impacts on the risk of physical abuse. If we click again, and then they add further post-its there. And this proved effective in building the links from climate change to child protection risks, where initially there can, and there was, pushback that the two are not related. And this activity then ends with identifying groups of young people who may be particularly vulnerable. If we can click again. And then next slide, please. So this approach, or one back, then opens the conversation for children to think about whether they have opportunities to participate in the decisions that are made on these impacts that they've identified that affect them, and whether their opinions are taken seriously. This then opens dialogue to discuss why or why not, and possible solutions. Um, next slide, please. These workshops then end with a discussion on actions that young people would like to see going forward. This can be shaped to include adaptation and anticipatory action. Looking at answers on adaptation, I've highlighted a few shared by children in the Caribbean. So linking back to our first discussion on why, children felt that being involved in climate action was a way to help with the mental health impacts of climate related disasters. Equally, climate adaptation actions in the pictures at, at the bottom of the slide can be framed as helping to address the impacts of climate change that can then exacerbate child protection risks. We also saw many requests for information on climate change and extreme weather events, both through peer to peer mechanisms and with experts and climate anxiety consistently came up 
um, in terms of anxiety about the future um, with ideas such as a dedicated app um, or opportunities for exchange to promote solidarity. And then on the right hand side, we also had some initial ideas on anticipatory action, which of course can be contextualized and, and fleshed out more. But as we mentioned previously, child friendly messaging uh, and communication were prominent, including maintaining technology, activating pre established support groups, and promoting helplines in advance of a forecast imminent extreme weather event. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. However, where it is no longer possible to adapt or cope with the negative impacts of climate change, this is called loss and damage. And so I wanted to return to Vanessa McCarty's speech at the Youth COP, who powerfully raised this agenda, highlighting it needs much greater commitment. And hence, I wanted to open the conversation today on whether the impacts of climate change on child protection risks could or should be framed as loss and damage. For example, where climate impacts force girls to drop out of school, and lose out on education, or when climate impacts cause livelihoods to be lost and child marriage is resorted to as a coping mechanism, changing the course of girls' lives against their will. There is then also the question on if and how um, children could or should participate in this evolving dialogue. So I want to leave this open for now as a crucial dialogue to be explored and continued. Uh, next slide, please. And then my final slide, um, I wanted to end with a potential opportunity to influence a new resource to advance children's voices on climate change, soon to be launched and endorsed uh, by a range of organisations, uh, including the Children in a Changing Climate Coalition. And the cards are, compromise, uh, are comprised of simple, fun, do-at-home activities for children aged 8 to 12. They introduce climate change, contextualise it and encourage children to think about the actions they would like to see happening ending with a creative call for climate action. The cards introduce differentiated impacts, but there could be scope to shape this further, again, to have a specific child protection lens. Um, and then next slide. The cards are due to be promoted at COP and launched formally following this. The idea is then for all the partner organizations to support their rollout with an aim to ensure there are outputs ready um, for young people to present a global children's call for climate action at the UNDRR global platform in May next year. We hope to also use the outputs to influence the children's charter on DRR. So this could be another entry point to explore integrating child protection risks and climate action. Um, and if there was interest in the Alliance, perhaps looking at having a specific child protection and climate, tr climate track to promote children's voices on this topic. Um, and then last slide, please. So I wanted to end the session to say that we're very open and keen to collaborate on these agendas and would be extremely interested to hear from others to discuss further the resources and initiatives shared today or other ideas and opportunities to advance this agenda. Um, so thank you very much for listening. We hope it was useful um, and hope to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. And we're over time a bit, so I will just conclude, but please look at some of the comments in the chat. There's some great links to click to, to really move forward on some of this, these action points. There's a, a big need for an intersectional lens moving forward, ensuring that we really address the needs of the most vulnerable children as well. Um, I'd ask the presenters to share their contacts in the chat. Um, there are, there's quite a flurry of questions. Some of the answers are on the Jamboard and presenters may be able to uh, continue to put some responses there. I'd also encourage the presenters to move into some of the discussion rooms in the next session where we will continue the conversation. So I just want to extend a warm thank you to each of our presenters. Uh, you've challenged us and encouraged us. It's a topic that can bring fear, but also hope. So we take all of that and uh, really hope to move forward uh, with action uh, in partnership with children. Thank you.